Hi guys, it's Catherine. So today I'm making a video that's part of my 100 Years of Suffrage series, which is celebrating the centenary of some women in the UK gaining the right to vote. And I've already made a video recommending some female historical fiction novels, and I will link that in the description and above in case you haven't seen it yet, because I won't um, mention any of those books in this video. So today I'm going to recommend some novels that discuss ideas surrounding feminism and womanhood, and I'm not going to call them feminist novels because some of them aren't and some of them are by authors who wouldn't identify as feminist and also some of them were just written before the word feminist was really part of our vernacular. Rather, I want to recommend some books that discuss the position of women in society, some of the injustices that women face and um, have some central characters who embody feminist ideals. So really, I just want this to be a video recommending books that are about what it's like to be a woman. I think this is important because, for me anyway, one of the main purposes of fiction is to generate empathy, and if by reading these books I gain a greater understanding of what life is like for a wide variety of women, then I am better equipped to help reduce some of the adversities that women face. So this is quite a small selection of books, I've tried to keep it quite limited because there are so many that I could talk about that fall under this umbrella term. But, um, and they're generally ones that I've read recently, so there may be some books that seem like obvious choices that are always in sort of top 10 feminist novel lists um, that you might not see here, but I'm sure you've heard loads about those ones already, so I've tried to choose a couple that were slightly off the beaten track. I'm going to start off with some classics and then move on to more contemporary novels. And some of these classics I would hesitate to call feminist, but they are a really important part of not only our literary canon, but uh, the history of our literary representation of women, and I think some of them really shapes the way we depict women in literature. And the first one is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, and I don't, I'm not going to talk about this one for very long because I feel like everything that can be said about this book has been said in relation to feminism, but um, I really feel like for a book of its time I have not read any others that represent women in the way that this book does. It's a bildungsroman and you get to see Jane's life from her early childhood right through and so you really get a sense of her inner thoughts and feelings. Um, I think she's unique as a character because she's not beautiful, un unlike most sort of female protagonists in books from this time period. She's not eminently marriageable and marriage indeed isn't at the forefront of her mind. I know it was published more than 150 years ago, but I still feel like I don't want to spoil the plot, so I'll be pretty vague, but there's a lot of feminist critique around this book, especially surrounding a female character who appears much later in the novel, um, and I think that's particularly interesting. And there is a book that I would like to read, um, A Wide Sargasso Sea by Jean Rhys, that focuses on this other female character. And then I want to recommend a few classics that are really about marriage, um, because I suppose in the 19th century this was one of the main focuses of a woman's life. It was really her the purpose that was ascribed to her societally. Um, so it's no wonder that it is the central focus of so many novels. The first one I want to recommend is Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. It was originally published in 1856 and it follows uh, an unhappily married woman who has affairs um, and of course it was quite controversial because of its depiction of this immoral activity. Uh, she's not necessarily what you would call a typical feminist heroine. She is very naive in her conception of love. Uh, she's frivolous with money and with her life. Um, but I think what this book really shows is the destructive capabilities of the patriarchal system she lives in um, on her psyche. She has high expectations of love and of her life. And she's continually disappointed because the reality doesn't match up to the descriptions she reads in romance novels. And I think what was particularly controversial about this book at the time was the lack of an authorial narrator. So it was expected that Flaubert would intervene in the narrative and say, well, she's doing these things, but I don't condone them. And you as a reader, of course, would never dream of doing this. And it kind of lacks this, so there's a type of moral ambiguity in the writing that is quite unique from this era. And then another book with a similar premise is Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, which was published in instalments between 1873 and 1877. And similarly, it's about a woman in an unhappy marriage 
who embarks on an affair. And um, yeah, it's about the patriarchal ideals that society puts upon her and also the um, institutions within this society um, like that of motherhood um, and also the complications surrounding divorce. It begins with one of the most famous lines in literature, happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And I think this is what is really at the core of this book, it's about the family structure and um, a woman's place within this. Next I want to talk about The Awakening by Kate Chopin. And I read this for the first time, literally just a few days ago, because I've been hearing about it quite a lot recently, and I've owned it for quite some time. And I've heard that it's very good, and I expected to maybe appreciate it in a literary sense, or um, kind of understand some of the feminist ideals that it was working towards. But I actually really enjoyed it as a piece of fiction as well. It was published in 1899 and is set in New Orleans following a dissatisfied wife, Edna Pontellier. Um, who undergoes different types of awakenings through this novel, both psychological and also sexual, um, which of course made it extremely controversial and it was widely censored at the time of its release. Its themes are quite similar to Madame Bovary in that it explores the oppression that women feel within the structure of marriage and the helplessness that they feel when they try to escape from this, um, and the censorship that Kate Chopin experienced as a result of this novel made it very difficult for her to get published afterwards and she actually died not that long after this book came out. The descriptions of desire in this book are of course not exactly explicit in relation to modern standards but at the time they were quite scandalous um, and they're actually very beautiful because they explore the psychological elements of um, Edna's lack of love within her marriage and her um, desire for another man, but also obviously her conflicting moral feelings towards this. I always worry that 19th century books are going to be quite hard to read, and I seem to forget every time that the 19th century is in fact a whole 100 years, and a book that's published right at the end, like this one, is going to be vastly different from Austen or Charlotte Bronte. Um, so actually this is an easy book to read. Um, it doesn't have kind of complex sentence structures like you find in, in much older books. It is highly readable, it's really enjoyable, and I would really recommend it. So now I'm going to move on to some more recent novels that have issues surrounding feminism that are maybe more pertinent to the present day. Um, they might have more overtly feminist characters or talk about different modes of oppression that are more common now. And I can't possibly make a video talking about feminist novels and not mention The Handmaid's Tale. So I'll get that one over with first. Of course, this is Margaret Atwood's 1985 dystopian novel about a society in which women um, are used as breeding machines, really, uh, for the rest of society as levels of fertility among women is rapidly decreasing. I think at its heart this book is about the oppression of female reproductive rights and the right of a woman to her own body. Interestingly, Margaret Atwood has rebutted the label of feminist for this novel, and sometimes for herself as well, um, and she says that the power structures within this novel are typical of a dictatorship in which there are hierarchies um, that oppress both men and women, and it is true that n not all men in this novel are in positions of power, and the societal structure in place here is also deeply unfair to them, but I do feel like um, it is weighted much more heavily against women. The reduction of women to commodities for breeding is certainly an extreme form of dictatorship and patriarchy, and whether you call this book feminist or not, I think it is still a really incisive look into power structures between genders. And as has been said many times before, this book feels unfortunately very timely now when we have a man in the White House who sees women as sexual commodities in a way similar to this book. A book I read recently and found really powerful was The Vegetarian by Han Kang, which was translated from the Korean and won the Man Booker International Prize in 2016. It's about a woman who chooses to become vegetarian, much to the dismay of her husband and the rest of her family. And interestingly, this book is told from three perspectives, none of which is her. This choice to deny the protagonist her own perspective is reflective of the cultural perception of her as a submissive wife and the assumptions that other people make about how she feels 
but um, that she is denied the outlet to express these views herself. This was really effective, to me at least, because the reader doesn't get to find out how she feels or the real reasons for her choosing vegetarianism. Um, and in a way we feel a small element of the helplessness that she feels in this situation. So this book is really about female autonomy, whether within a marriage or in a parental relationship or in society as a whole. It's quite a disturbing book, it has a lot of sexual violence in it and it is just quite an unusual read as well. It is a reinterpretation of um, one of the stories from Ovid's Metamorphoses in which Daphne uh, is transformed into a tree to avoid the sexual advances of Apollo. It's a very difficult book to read because of the subject matter and I think it's made potentially more difficult by the really blunt and simple but very beautiful writing style and I have to give a lot of credit to the translator Deborah Smith for this. I think she did an excellent job. For such a short book it really packs in a lot and it's more than just about gender. I think it really explores mental illness and the relationships between human and art and the way women are expected to behave in public and in particular how this manifests in Korean society. Another book that explores female suffering is Peach by Emma Glass which was just published very recently and I wasn't sure whether to include this on the list because I didn't always feel like it was absolutely successful at achieving its aims but I've never read a book that is quite as visceral in describing trauma and um, I think for that reason it really adds to the discussion about sexual violence towards women. This is an experimental novella exploring the aftermath of a traumatic event, a rape, and it doesn't have a huge amount of plot in it but I think it aims to evoke emotion in the reader through the really poetic nature of the prose and it's kind of hard to describe so I'm actually just going to read the first few lines to give you an idea of the type of writing that it includes. Thick stick sticky sticking wet ragged wool winding round the wound stitching the sliced skin together as I walk scraping my mittened hand against the wall rough red bricks ripping the wool ripping the skin rough red skin rough red head I pull the fuzzy mitten from my fingers wincing as the torn thread grips the greys on my knuckles it is dark the blood is black dry crack crackly crackling the smell of burnt fat clogs my nostrils I put my fingers to my face and wipe the grease away so as you can tell it's pretty weird and I think overall it is really effective at um, conveying these horrible emotions in a really visceral way. I think that is the best word for it. And I particularly liked how this trauma begins to manifest itself in every element of the protagonist Peach's life. And everything that surrounds her begins to remind her of this cataclysmic event that happens to her. The book is only a hundred pages long and I think that's a good length for it. I think if it was any longer it would be difficult to get through and there were times where I felt the writing was a little bit forced and I considered whether or not to put it on this list because it's really it's not about female empowerment or um, kind of feisty protagonists but it is still about a topic that is really relevant to feminism of course female sexual, vi or sexual violence towards women is a massive issue in the 21st century unfortunately and I think it is something that ought to be engaged with in literature but not in a gratuitous way and I think this is successful at doing that. Next is a more recent piece of dystopian fiction and it's The Power by Naomi Alderman and it won the Bailey's Prize for fiction last year um, and it's also about the power structure between men and women and this power imbalance but in quite a different sense because it is a kind of um, sci-fi inspired novel where women suddenly gain the physical advantage over men by overnight be gaining the ability to conduct electricity through their hands and inflict great suffering on men or anyone should they wish. I've made an entire separate review specifically about this book so I will link it above and in the description and I won't say too much about it here but I think it is a really interesting portrayal of the way power has the ability to corrupt and there are characters in this book who wield this power they are suddenly given very irresponsibly 
And I think that is unfortunately only reflective of what would happen in real life if this were to occur. Another book that is a reinterpretation of a story from Ovid's Metamorphoses is Ali Smith's Girl Meets Boy. And it's a retelling of the story of Iphis and Ianthe. And Iphis is a girl who is brought up as a boy in a society that is much kinder towards men. And she meets and falls in love with the girl Ianthe. And in order for them to be together, the goddess Isis transforms Iphis into a boy so that Iphis and Ianthe can marry. The story is transposed into a modern setting in Ali Smith's novel. And like all of her books, it's really about everything, but it has quite a sparse plot. It is about two sisters, Anthea and Imogen, who both work at a bottled water company. And the politics in this novel really justify a whole video of their own because it is, it really explores the commodification of a natural resource and a human right um, in, a, in a really interesting way. In this book, Anthea falls in love with Robin, a girl who is an activist protesting against this bottled water company. And she is very androgynous and she pushes the boundaries of heteronormative sexuality. I'm still discovering Ali Smith's writing, but I feel like she's going to become a favourite author of mine. Her writing is so sharp, it's so intellectually curious, but it's also so funny and her wordplay and punning throughout all the books I've read so far is brilliant. Her writing is so refreshing and I really enjoyed this book because it feels quite hopeful and that's nice, especially considering so many books that are about women's place in society are often quite devoid of hope. My last recommendation is actually not a novel, it's a book of short stories, but it's one that I've not heard that many people talking about but I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's called What It Means When a Man Falls From the Sky by Leslie Neka Arima. She's lived in the UK, Nigeria and the US and she draws on these experiences to create a really international collection of stories. And it's quite eclectic, it's a mixture of very realist tales about family dynamics of teenagers living in Nigeria or travelling to their ancestral home of Nigeria from the UK or US. Um, but it also has some quite magical realist stories in there as well. One that I found really powerful was about a childless woman who works in a hairdresser who makes a baby out of the hair of other people and it was actually very moving. I think this collection spans a lot of themes um, but it is I think at its core about women, especially young women showing disobedience or trying to push against the constraints of society. The title story is the most ambitious in this collection and it's about a post-apocalyptic world where most of the planet is underwater and um, there are lots of British immigrants moving to Nigeria and they form the Biafra Britannia Alliance and it's also about a cure for grief that is devised. It is very complex for such a small and short story um, and really interesting. So I feel like it might be reductive to call it a collection of feminist stories because it is a lot more than that and it spans a lot of other ideas but I think it does have a common thread running through about womanhood and I would just recommend it to everyone because it is a really great collection of stories. So I think those are all the ones I'm going to talk about today and I hope you enjoyed my recommendations. Let me know if you've read any of these ones or if you have other suggestions for me. I think there are so many others that I could have talked about and I think maybe in the future I might make a part two to this video. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you really soon. Bye bye!